Our scripture reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. So, brothers and sisters, because of God's mercies, I encourage you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. This is your appropriate priestly service. Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world and be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can figure out what God's will is, what is good and pleasing and mature. Because of the grace that God gave me, I can say to each one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Instead, be reasonable since God has measured out a portion of faith to each one of you. We have many parts in one body, but the parts don't all have the same function. In the same way, though, there are many of us. We are one body in Christ, and individually, we belong to each other. This ends the reading. Let's pray together. Lord, in the midst of our worship, in the middle of our singing praises, lifting our prayers, we come to you now to listen. Help us to hear, create in us a spirit of hearing that we may know your word and that you may touch our lives. We pray, Lord, for the preacher and the words he shares. May it indeed be your word and not his own, but revelation from your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A few days ago, we all experienced the trauma of having a convicted murderer escape Chester County Prison. The atmosphere was intense, wasn't it? Daniello Cavalcante turned out to be a master athlete, a determined individual, and an excellent masquerader, not to mention an escape artist. I'm going to talk about another escape artist now. But first, think about what you experienced. You know, many of you in this congregation found yourselves dealing with roadblocks, lockdowns, and fear. Now, several years ago, just after the new Ape House was opened in the Philadelphia Zoo, like Daniello Cavalcante, a male orangutan sat staring at the new enclosure, studying it carefully. The following day, he was MIA gone. He figured a way to get out without anybody knowing it. He had escaped. Now the zoo quickly found him and fixed the flaw in the enclosure that provided that opportunity. But both Cavalcante and that orangutan wanted to change their environment. We want to do that too. And we go about it in many different ways. Here's an old song you might remember. It's called Side by Side, which melodically puts our vanity on display. We got married last Friday. My girl was right there beside me. Our friends were all gone. We were alone side by side. We were so happily wed when she got ready for bed, then her teeth and her hair she placed in a chair side by side. (laughs) One glass eye so tiny, one hearing aid so small, then she took one leg off and placed it on the chair by the wall. I stood there broken hearted, 
Most of my girl had departed. I slept on the chair. There was more of her there, side by side. His new wife had changed. In the case, he didn't like what he saw in the morning. And this morning's text is a significant direction and plea to change. It calls for us to be transformed from the inside out. We wear different clothes and get a suntan or a bottle of tan to darken our skin color. Or as the poor groom found out, a lot of opportunities to help us appear abnormal, acceptable, I'm sorry, appear normal and acceptable and even attractive to those around us. Cosmetic companies make a lot of money so we can masquerade and hide our flaws. We can put on a disguise or a mask attempting to change our looks. However, those attempts don't change who we are. Others see us quite differently. Often they see who we are and what we value more than we know. Let me share this passage from the message. Same one we just read. Savor the difference in the words. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Now, I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, and especially, I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then, as every one of you does, in pure grace, it's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, 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 God brings it to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us, not by what we are and what we do for him. In this way, we are like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets the meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body or of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and our function as a part of his body. But as a chopped off finger or cut off toe wouldn't amount to much, neither would we. Since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellent form and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body. Let's do, let's go ahead and be what we're made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we're not. Sounds a little different than what we read, doesn't it? This is the passage uh, for me uh, that I really embraced when I read the message. Now at the core of this chapter are two questions. The first is, who are we? What drives us? What are we telling others about ourselves? Like that poor, mature, honeymooning couple in Side by Side, when we drop the facade, what others see is interesting. 
because it's who we really are. A false identity is one problem. Our identity, when all is said and done, drives our behavior. If we identify as the head of our family, we will act and be treated one way. If we think we have control not only of ourselves but also of others, and think we can control others, we can turn out to be dictatorial, hurtful, and make awful decisions. Some people, you see, have not grown beyond the my way or the highway mentality and attitude of their early childhood and teen years, regardless of age. I love the old saying, I think it was Mark Twain who said, the difference between being two years old and 13 years old is 11 years. Two-year-olds just turn into 13-year-olds, but their attitudes don't change because it's a time of transition and a time of trying new things. But they're just as difficult to deal with. Twain also said that uh, when a child turns nine, you ought to put him in a barrel. Keep them in a barrel. When they turn into teenagers, you put a lid on the barrel and feed them through the hole in the barrel. And you can let them out when they're 21. Now we're all kind of chuckling because we remember, don't we? But we're just as rebellious. Who of us in this room can't look back on our lives and recognize that in our memory banks are some terrific memories of our experiences? And co-mingled with those memory bank, in those memory banks are some really huge mistakes, blunders, and regrets. Maturity, you see, requires change. And some of us stay the same way. Depending on our personalities, we may be stuck using the same behavior or may be regressed into the behavior of, an old, of our old age, the age we were. It's like we're teens again, even in our old age. And though the behavior is inappropriate, we don't recognize it. Therefore, at 60, 70, 80, or even 90, that self-centered teenager is still trying to find out who he is or who she is, and wanting the power to cover themselves, even though we know that our choices as we age sometimes get fewer. Mature and real change comes to us from the inside. So the question we face today, regardless of our age, is who do we want to be? For a Christian, it means self-examination and shifting from the question that drives our decisions and lives from what do I want to do or be to who does God want me to be and do. There's still time, no matter our age, to become renewed in faith and mind, if not in body. I think St. Paul is making the path and pleas from the depths of his heart for us to change our lives. I guess that's why what attracts me to the first verses of this text, that's, that's what does it, the, the, the kind of common language, the context he puts it in. Now, he trans uh, Peterson translated that, uh, that verse, this whole Bible started with preparing his Bible study class. So he actually wrote and translated this piece in his study of the Book of Romans for his congregation in Bel Air, Maryland. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering, embracing what God does for you is best. It's the best thing you can do for him. God's calling for a complete transformation of mind, soul, and body. At least as far as we can control our minds and bodies. 
But here Paul probably sounds like your primary care physician. What does yours say? Lose some weight. Eat more. Change your diet. Get more exercise. Get some rest. Get some exercise. It doesn't end, does it? And all those directions are for your own good. And just as your doctor's addressing your mental and physical health, Paul is addressing your spiritual selves, which ultimately is more important. He understands what we all know and frequently ignore. Though preachers have tried to tell us for millennia, it's what's inside that ultimately counts. It is possible to comply with our doctors, families, or friends, suggestions and still live lives inconsistent with a Christian life. At times we even convince ourselves that it's okay to live that way. Sometimes we don't like what we're being told by doctors, friends, and even churches. If we hear preaching with which we disagree, we change the source of our discomfort externally rather than internally. We leave the church. Happens all the time. Take the case of Mrs. Y. A. Skipperound of the mythical East Burlap Church. Now, the Reverend Dr. Richard N. Rinker tells us about one role she had in the church in a poignant and comical book he wrote as his doctoral dissertation. It's irreverent, humorous, and describes the culture of many churches from the 60s right on up through today. Let me share just a portion of it with you. You may not have heard how successful our East Burlap Church was in finding a new pastor. When Dr. Toombs, their pastor of 58 years, was called to serve as youth director at a large urban church, a committee was immediately appointed to locate prospects for a successor. The Creeps, now that's the committee responsible for engaging an exceptional preacher, went to work on a set of standards by which a minister ought to be selected. Members of the committee included Mr. C.M. Hedmiss and chairman, a traveling salesman on weekends, and a pump and drain repairman during the week. Mrs. Y.A. Skipperound, formerly a Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, and just recently transferred from the Pentecostal gospel denomination to her East Burlap Church. And Miss Elvira Throttlefast, Sunday school teacher for 58 years. Now, what were the basic requirements? Well, this is what the committee came up with. One, the man must be less than 35 years old with 25 years of pulpit experience. (laughs) He must have a wife who has had experience in church school work, sewing circles, janitorial work, institutional cooking, and parsonage rebuilding. And oh yeah, if she's a musician, that's just a bonus. They must have at least three children of Sunday school age who exemplify perfectly the biblical adage, children should be seen and not heard. Theologically, he should be orthodox, socially conservative, biblically faithful to the original Bible, that is the St. James Version, economically ultra-frugal, political anti-change, and ecclesiastically comfortable. He must be a high school graduate, punctual, and most importantly of all, he's got to be religious. Now there's more to this story, and I'm just gonna let you hang in. I brought the book, it's this one. I brought the book, it's a great little read. And if some of you want to know after the service, I'll share with you what the end of the story is. Now, while this church is mythical, the underlying concerns are similar to many churches even today. Rather than be challenged, members like Mrs. Y. A. Skipperound
frequently change their congregational affiliation. And God bless any pastor who has a different theological view or confronts a member about immoral behavior. I once served a little congregation as a short term, a short interim pastor. Facing it, we faced a dilemma regarding a couple teaching Sunday school. They made a good team. No one could argue about that. But they cohabitated for a long unmarried, in a long unmarried relationship. The person who came to me reported and wanted to give me some advice. They wanted me to confront the couple about their marital relationship or lack of it, as the case goes. Members would leave the church if this immoral situation was not addressed. Now, I know that this is a no-win situation. Been there, done that. Today, many congregations would not address it. And my experience has been that if you do address it, the most likely outcome is that the couple will pack their bags and move out. Yep. They will likely leave the church, blaming the pastor as they slam the door behind them. And what reaction is true, and that reaction is true, whenever someone doesn't like it. And so what do you do with them? Dealing with bad conduct in the church, bad witness, is very, very difficult. And the United Methodist Church has a history that looks always at confrontation as a matter of restoration, not punishment. And our rules of order embraces a threefold process to rehabilitate folks who have strayed. And in that context of history, it doesn't matter what is right or wrong that changes history. It's what people believe is right or wrong, no matter how theologically or morally correct and justified the congregation might be. It's not uncommon to hear a person drop out of a church and say they were leaving because the pastor said something they didn't like. And from then on, there is no ministry with that person. They cut themselves off and sometimes they are cut off. That's true mainly because no one wants to be confronted with their sin, with their shortcomings, things they probably already feel a little guilty about. They justify their behavior economically, socially, or theologically. Still at the heart of this is that they have been embarrassed and instead of dealing with their behavior, they leave and avoid it. The church has lost any ministry that might have existed with them. That kind of confrontation is challenging and usually results in a loss because it comes from the outside, the behavior, and not from the internal sources of faith and reconciliation. Generally, People today cannot accept Paul's direction to present their bodies as a living sacrifice because conforming to their environment and fitting in is more comfortable. But it's the only path to living a holy life. Self-examination, looking inward to change outward, should be a part of a daily devotional routine. What shortcomings must we confront as part of the transformation process. What do we need to repent of? Where have we been dismissive of someone? Who have we wrongly judged? What opportunity did we miss because we were so focused on something that we missed what was right in front of us? It's not hard for us to be so focused on the sins of the other that we forget our own sin. To see ourselves as we are, as God and frequently others see us, is at least uncomfortable. And yet we need 
we need to see ourselves in order to make our lives different. Paul says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. The second question is just as touchy. Considering who God wants us to be requires change if we're honest with ourselves. And change does not come quickly or easily. God wants us to have a proper perspective and focus on life. Pastor Eric Ritz suggests how that can happen with with a short parable. He says, I once heard a story of an old Navajo Indian in Arizona who became a very wealthy man when oil was found on his property. But wealth didn't change him. He lived just as before while the money piled up in the bank. Every now and then, the old man would visit the bank and say to the banker, crops all dried up, sheep all dead, cattle all stolen. The banker knew exactly what to do. He'd take the old man into the vault, seat him at a table, and place several bags of silver dollars in front of him so that he could count them. After a while, the man would come out and say, Crops fine, sheep all alive, cattle all back. Why the change? He had simply reviewed his resources and reminded himself of what he had to fall back on. This is what believers must do when the pressure comes. When we feel like complaining and murmuring, let's remember who we are called to be in Christ and what he has promised for times and stress. Remember the commercial, there's no wine before it's time? Well, there's no salvation without changing our hearts and focusing on God's will for us rather than telling God what and who we want to be. Let's pray. Lord of salvation. It's always difficult for us to do what scripture calls us to do. You call us to focus our lives on your will, but without your constant presence with us, we'll fail. So now, Lord, as we prepare to celebrate the Holy Sacrament, enable us to hear anew your call and your offer to stand by us when we put you first in our lives. Strengthen us in the particular ministry you have placed us. You know us honestly, Lord. Help us to grasp who you want us to be and to change from the inside out. We pray in the name of our crucified Savior, Jesus, our Christ. Amen.